Welcome to Take 5 Action, brought to you by the Forest City Film Festival. My name is Matthew Downs, and this is a podcast about some people who inspire me and the movies that inspire them. As a young filmmaker, movies have made their mark on my life. And I believe that our favorite films can inspire us to dream bigger and even change the way that we look at the world. When I look up to industry professionals, I wonder what movies have inspired them to the heights that they've reached. So join me in conversation with creatives as we discuss the five movies that define their careers. This is scene one, take four, action. I want to welcome to the show today our guest, Robert Boudreau. Robert is a director from London, Ontario, originally. Uh, He's now working in Hollywood on films like Born to be Blue, which uh, starred Ethan Hawke and is about the jazz musician Chet Baker. Uh, And then afterwards, his follow-up film to that was Stockholm, also starring Ethan Hawke, about the, uh, the Stockholm Syndrome bank robbery, the you know, the namesake bank robbery there. Both are fantastic films, and if you haven't seen them, you should definitely check them out. Uh, But Robert has uh, taken some time out of a very tight schedule to be here. Um, So I just want to thank you for coming in today, Robert. Thanks for having me. Awesome. So Robert, you're working on a new film. Uh, Is there anything you can tell? Is it secret or is there anything you can tell us about Mm -hmm. your new film that you're working on? No, it's it's not secret. It's um, <clears throat> the movie's called Delia's Gone. It was a film that I shot uh, this past fall, which um, I just locked the picture on, so I'm just kind of in sound post production now. Uh, it's it's a rural uh, crime drama about this guy Lewis, who's kind of goes on this journey to find out uh, the truth about his sister Delia's death. Um, it uh, stars Stefan James, who is in If Bill Street Could Talk and Homecoming. Fantastic um, actor. Yeah, Stefan was amazing. Um, Marissa Tomei, who most people know, uh, Travis Fimmel uh, from Vikings, and Paul Walter Hauser from uh, Richard Jewell and I, Tanya. Um, so it was, it was a great cast, and I'm really excited about it. And so it's, um, you know, we're going to be kind of delivering that later this summer and hopefully playing some fall film festivals before it goes out to the world. Awesome. No, that's a fantastic cast. So you said you shot that last fall. Was that a quarantine shoot? It was indeed. Yeah, we shot it. it we started shooting in October into November uh, before there was even COVID insurance in Canada. And so it was uh, extremely challenging. Uh, but um, But yeah. it's kind of a miracle we pulled it off. Do you have any stories from that? Because I've I've wanted to hear more about just like how people are making movies right now. You know, when the world is as it is, uh, like well, all pretty smooth, or uh, you know, no, no, I wouldn't say smooth. But I mean, there there's two sides of making a movie. The one side is is getting to the point where you can make it. So putting the financing together and all that, which is particularly challenging. Um, with COVID because of some of these boring things like insurance and completion bonds and quarantining American actors for 14 days. And then the other part of it is just the production aspect, which is just having to be extra careful, obviously, and and have a lot of additional COVID people around and, and, and sign in protocols and shorter days and limited crew. But I kind of like working with smaller crews. And so that part of it wasn't really a problem for me. Um, but yeah, it was certainly very challenging on on many fronts. But um, all, all films are challenging in their own ways. So. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is definitely a unique set of challenges that, you know, pre this year, I don't think anyone's ever had to face. But um, I mean, you got through it and you said you're just picture locked, right? Yeah, we picture locked a few weeks ago. Yeah. Well, congratulations. That's like a, a big step. So. Thanks, man. <laughs> Uh, Well, I'm looking forward to seeing the film, and we're just going to jump right into today's podcast. So uh, this is Take 5 Action, and the way this podcast works, if you're a new listener, uh, we have uh, given Robert five categories, uh, five categories that kind of correspond to different parts of his career and his life. And Robert's given us back five movies, uh, each corresponding with one of our categories. So it kind of... uh, I've I've watched all of the films now. Uh, I've gone through them in the past week, and I'm ready to talk about them. Uh, And so the categories that we have, uh, they start with Robert's earliest inspiration as to what got him interested in movies, uh, all the way to now, uh, as a working director, what is inspiring him in the industry at the moment. Um, So the first category that we have is 
inspiration. And the movie that you gave me here was Raging Bull. Um, so Raging Bull, that's, I mean, kind of a Goliath of a film right there. I mean, that's an absolute classic. Uh, for anyone who hasn't watched, it's a 1980 Scorsese movie. Uh, it's about a boxer named Jake LaMotta starring Robert De Niro. Uh, and it's really about um, Jake LaMotta's uh, temper in and out of the ring, uh, the temper that made him a star in the ring and that kind of tore his life apart in a Shakespearean tragic way outside of it. Uh, so Robert, uh, when, what was the first time you watched this movie? Like when did Raging Bull come into your life? Well, the reason I listed it as an, as an inspiration is it, it did come into my life a very early. I don't remember the exact age. I do have a vivid memory of, of watching it um, in the basement of my girlfriend's house at the time. And her, I remember her father was there too. And he was kind of wondering like, why did you bring home this guy who's like interested in movies like this? Cause it's a, it's a pretty intense film. And I, so I must've been about, uh, must've been about 15 or 16. Um, kind and of you thing. brought over like and, the VHS tape and you were like, we're going to yeah, watch this. I brought it over and said, I, so I probably had just seen it slightly earlier, but at the time I lived in, I grew up in a place called Ingersoll, Ontario, which is about 20 minutes outside of London, Ontario. And my friend and I, um, would always go to the New Yorker repertory cinema in London when we were teens. That was kind of our escape. And obviously we had VHS. And and so even though like Raging Bull is my favorite film to this day, and it is a, like a, but it's just funny that it actually was one of the earlier films that I became obsessed with. And, and I, I, I still am obsessed with it. And so um, it just, everything about it, like the, the you know, I, I grew up, very heavily into sports. And so I was always attracted to sports movies, but this is like, unlike any sports movie one has seen because Scorsese doesn't really have much interest in the sport of boxing, but he has a lot of interest in just kind of how he uses that to transcend comment on, on masculinity and violence. And, well, and he films purely... it kind of like an art form. He films it like it's a uh, ballet, right? Exactly. Like it's, it was so unexpected because I expected this boxing movie um, and it is, there's great boxing sequences, but it, it's, it's got Italian like operatic music and it's in black and white and it's got brilliant slow motion. And, and it's just like a technical, it's just like blows your mind and from like from a directorial point of view about how he Scorsese blends such a naturalistic performances, which with such stylized technical stuff, which has now almost become cliche, but a lot of, a lot of those techniques, um, but even at that young age, at 15 or 16, whatever it was, I, I was just blown away by it. And there's something kind of mysterious about it that's always kind of haunted me since, you know, I first saw it. Mm -hmm. Well, I feel like, I mean, for me, uh, the film that made, that inspired me, got me into movies, uh, was my favorite film for a very long time, recently like dethroned. But it's interesting to say that, uh, to hear that the film that kind of inspired you is still to this day your favorite film. How often do you find yourself going back and rewatching it? Um, I haven't rewatched it for a few years now, but you had mentioned in the intro I, I did a movie with Ethan Hawke called Born to Be Blue, and I certainly Ethan and I talked a lot about um, a lot. Of, I don't want to jump ahead or anything, but Ethan and I. I talked a lot about it on that, that movie when I made that movie later in my career. Um, and so I, yeah, I usually every year or two, I see it. There's certain, there's certain periods where I've probably seen it, you know, 30 or 40 times, but um, it just depends on what I'm up to at the time, you know, but it's always, it's always there. And I've got a, I've got my raging bull poster on my wall here, which um, is uh Oh, it's always um, so I'm staring at I'm staring at it every day that I'm in the office. So, <laughs> yeah, it's an iconic poster, too. It's great. Yeah, I, I did. You brought up Born to be Blue as well, because I that was something that struck me with a lot of your film choices, but specifically Raging Bull. Like I can see a lot of it in your films, like Born to be Blue and Stockholm. Both really feel like they have elements of that, uh, you know, Jake LaMotta anti-hero, you know, the guy that you're following and, you know, who's so talented but has that kind of real self-destructive streak to him. Um, like, it is it is interesting that it's like a conscious thing, especially with Born to be Blue, because there's there's so much uh, Jake LaMotta in, in your Chet Baker. Um, 
Yeah, and you know, one of the beautiful things about Raging Bull is this love, this odd love triangle between Jake LaMotta, his brother, played by Joe Pesci, and then Kathy Moriarty, who plays Vicky, his wife, girlfriend. And in Born to be Blue, there's a bit of an odd triangle between Chet Baker, his his manager, who's played by Callum Keith Rennie, and then his his girlfriend, wife, played by Carmen Jogo, and the kind of the, the tensions in that relationship of, of either the athlete or the musician with their manager. And in that, like in born in um, raging bull, he's kind of like brother manager. He also manages him. And then, and then the woman in his life and in raging bull, it's like, he's choosing kind of violence and boxing over love ultimately. And in, in born to be blue, it's this, it's this music and drug addiction. That's really his true love. And the, the woman in love is kind of secondary in the end. He makes a choice that reflects that. And so, there was, there was quite a bit, and you know, being able to do a bit of black and white. There was certainly it was more overt in Born to Be Blue than in Stockholm, but um, but you're right. The kind of the the very flawed uh, anti-hero kind of lead character exists in both, and I think Ethan really enjoyed kind of playing those. Yeah, well, I mean, is. Is that something that you find yourself attracted to in other films as well? Because I know Scorsese, outside of uh, Raging Bull, a lot of his films have that sort of character as well. Uh, so, like, is there any other Scorsese movies that really stand out that have like inspired your films and kind of uh, stuck with you in a similar man- manner to Raging Bull? Well, I mean, Taxi Driver is right up there. I mean, I, I think I, I did see Taxi Driver at the time. I, Raging Bull has always been maybe a, a, like a little bit ahead of Taxi Driver, but Taxi Driver I did discover around the same time too. Because as soon as I saw Raging Bull, I think I saw that first. I was like, oh my god, what else has this guy done? And then I saw Taxi Driver, and like, and it, that just blew me away in like almost almost the same degree. Um, but to me, those two films of the '70s were were head and shoulders above anything else. Like I always loved Mean Streets too, but it, to me, it wasn't at quite at the same level as Taxi Driver, or Raging Bull. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't in, it wasn't kind of a, again until Goodfellas in, in 1990, 10 years later, that I was really like, like I, I loved all like a lot of the films in between from After Hours to King of Comedy, The Last Temptation, like in, in their own ways, but not not on this kind of like super high yeah. level. And Goodfellas to me also represented like a more modern uh, aesthetic and he used a lot of different technical things in Goodfellas. And I do remember seeing that because I was still pretty young when he made that. I was still in my 20s. And I, I remember seeing that in Woodstock, Ontario, the cinema in around 1990, whenever that was, and being pretty blown away. Um, and that, you know, even now, that's like 30 years old, but it doesn't, I guess I'm, I guess, I guess I'm getting old. But, um, and uh, yeah, but those, those would be the other films. It's, I, I have to link something together here because I'm seeing a, a real connection. So you say that uh, your two favorites are obviously Raging Bull and Taxi Driver, both written by Paul Schrader. Uh, so that seems like more of the link there. But then Ethan Hawke was just in First Reformed with Paul Schrader. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. like I'm, uh, I'm definitely seeing a link there that it seems like the, uh, the attraction there is to like that kind of Paul Schrader, like anti-hero uh, of Jake LaMotta, Travis Bickle, um, and yeah, I definitely see that in a lot of your films as well. Yeah, it's funny because in some ways, like if you look at Taxi Driver, that 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 is a that's that's a script narrative driven movie. Like that was really Paul Schrader's baby, and he spoke about it, it was a very personal movie for him. And that was like uh, like that was his script through and through that Scorsese Scorsese came on and did. Whereas Raging Bull was was really like De Niro's film that Scorsese's pal, Marduk Martin, kind of started writing. Uh, and then they brought Schrader on and Schrader kind of worked on it. But then ultimately De Niro and Scorsese just made it their own. And so, yeah, you're right. It is technically a Schrader film, but I don't really consider it a Schrader film like Taxi Driver is a Schrader film. Uh, uh, Raging Bull to me is is just really like a De Niro film, a De Niro, um, a Scorsese film. Uh, and obviously, you know, Schrader did some some great work on it. Um, but I think you're right in, in terms of uh, that sensibility that Schrader brought of that kind of outside loner uh, guy who's, you know, it's, it's like making an unlikable guy fascinating. And, and when we talk about some of the other movies that 
I have on my list. There's, you know, that that comes up again as well. It's a common it's theme. A, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I I also want to bring up. You said that you first saw Raging Bull at the New Yorker. Uh, obviously, I'm also from London, Ontario, uh, and I. I I never got to experience that. You know, the the New Yorker, I think, closed. I, I don't know when it closed, but um, it's not around. And I, I never got to experience that. But I know that I, probably very similar to you, would have spent, like, a lot of my days just retreating to to that repertory cinema. Because, uh, yeah, definitely, I, I kind of fell in love with movies at, probably at the same time that you did. Um, like, around, not the same time, but, like, around the same age. Um, and, yeah, I... I so wish that I would have had a resource like that in in the city that I lived in to to go to and to to catch some of those movies and classics, right? But we're going to move right on into the next movie. Uh, and the category here is Exploration. So this is a movie after the initial inspiration of Raging Bull. Uh, as Robert kind of, you know, dug through more films, um, this is a film that really stu- stood out uh, as a key moment. Uh, and the film that you gave here is Phantom Lady, which actually before uh, before you emailed this and, and said that this was your second pick, I'd never heard of this film before. Uh, so I was really happy to be able to go and check this out. So Robert, actually, you, you can probably describe this maybe better than I can. So what, what exactly for our listeners is Phantom Lady? Well, to me, Phantom Lady is kind of a classic 1940s film noir um, directed by uh, a great director, Robert Siodmak, who is like like a lot of the noir directors, a, a German um, uh, immigrant who came to Hollywood and brought his German expressionism, which which kind of helped create noir. Uh, mo- most of those great directors at the time, I mean, people like Fritz Lang and some of the others came earlier, but a lot of them came in the 30s and 40s. And it's, it's basically, you know, like a lot of noirs, uh, uh, a, a, a crime mystery uh, story. In, in this case, it's a story about a guy who's um, kind of falsely accused of of um, of killing his wife, and, and his alibi was that he he met this mysterious woman with this strange hat, who is the Phantom Lady, and uh, that evening. But when he when he gives that alibi, no one seems to no one can track her down. No one seems to know that she exists, mm-hmm. and so. His they all secretary. remember him. No one remembers her. Yeah, they all remember him, but for some reason, no one remembers her. And he starts to think, well, was he, was that a figment of his imagination? Was she a phantom? Or And then his his young secretary, who kind of has a shine for him, as well as the chief of police, start start to think, well, may, you know, maybe there was uh, a woman. And so it's really the, the point of view shifts because the main, you know, the, the male hero who we think is going to be his film, he goes to prison and then this female played by Ella Raines kind of takes over and becomes kind of the quote unquote detective to track down this phantom lady. And then we, you know, at the end we realize that, um, you know, there was, there was some uh, double crosses happening, all the classic noir stuff. And yeah. there's, there's a killer who is his friend and the killer happens to be in a lot of the scenes. And so it, it's weird because to me, you know, there's a lot of film noir that I, that I rate as a lot higher than the phantom lady. But for whatever reason, um, I went to film school in Vancouver. Um, and when I, I know coming out of film school, like a lot of people, you get obsessed with film noir because it's such a rich world. And I, I, I've, I've seen hundreds of those noirs. But Phantom Lady's always stuck with me, um, maybe because it's one of the lesser noirs. And noir is all about kind of B films and stuff. And so the classics like Double Indemnity or Maltese Falcon and all that, like those are, those are better, more classic films. Um, and a bunch of Orson Welles films, but Phantom Lady stuck with me just because there's a there's a jazz sequence in Phantom Lady where um, this woman, the secretary, gets pulled into this all night jazz club. That to me is just one of the greatest sequences in film, and it, it was an inspiration for me when I was exploring uh, my career because the very first short film I did was a black and white jazz film called Dream Recording which was kind of inspired a bit by that little sequence in Phantom Lady. Um, and so it just, it's always just stuck with me, that film. Mm-hmm. It is such an interesting film. And like you said, I, I think you brought up a really interesting point that like, yeah, there's noir is such a rich genre because there's so many of them, you know, in, in the forties, 
and even through the 50s, they just churned those out, like, nonstop. Um, mm. And so there are so many of them, and it is kind of interesting because it, it's a B genre. Uh, it's a lot more interesting to look at the ones that aren't seen in, like, the, the canon, uh, so to speak, right? Mm. Because, you know, they're B movies, right? They're, they were never uh, designed to be, like, canonized films. They were never, like, designed with the intent of, like, being ranked as one of the greatest films of all time. And a lot of them now are. But looking at one that, uh, you know, was very much like it was there and then it was gone. That was kind of how the films were designed. Um, and I don't know. It's it's a really fascinating film as well. Um, the the story's very twisty and turny, which is what I always look for in like a good film noir. So when did you first see this? Like, how did you discover this? Because this is a film that I don't think I ever would have stumbled on on my own. It's a good question. I, I suspect I probably saw it. Um, so I, I went to the Van, Vancouver Film School around 99, 2000. So I, I was born in 74. So I was about, I was like in my mid 20s, mid to early 20s then. So this was after Raging Bull and all that, which was more of my teens. So this is after I've, I've, I've left Ingersoll and I've, I've gone off into the world. And, uh, and I think in film school, you know, we studied noir. Like I had seen some film noir before film school, but film school is what really turned me on. I just remember living in Vancouver in this apartment and just rent, like watching two or three noirs like every night for like six months. Like I, I probably knocked off between 50 and 75 noirs within the first like half year of the program. Um, and and it, w- it, w- it would have been in that batch. And okay. it would have just... It just would have been like any other kind of noir, but for whatever reason, like I said, it it stuck. Um, it stuck in my mind. Um, like there's, you know, so, some of the like a movie like Vertigo, which is one of my favorite films, has got noir elements, but it's a '50s film and it's Hitchcock, and it's 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 so it's kind of more than just film noir, and so. I didn't want to pick that, even though that, like that's a far superior movie and probably more inspirational to me than Phantom Lady. But to me, Phantom Lady is, like you said, your classic film noir, which um, is just really strong, really well done, cheaply made, but beautifully executed. And to me, I chose that because it represents that point in my career when I was going to film school and all the noirs I saw and how film noir as a whole has influenced my filmmaking from my short films to Born to be Blue, because Born to be Blue has a black and white jazz sequence with Miles and Dizzy with canted angles and kind of extremisms, which again is, I was thinking of Phantom Lady when I made Born to be Blue. And so that that's that's why it's kind of important to me, that film. Yeah. So what is it, you said that you, you just spent, you know, months going through just countless film noirs. What is it that has always drawn you to that genre in particular? Because I mean, like, I've I've had that with you know certain genres, but I I don't think I've ever done that with film noir specifically. You know, for me, it's usually been like I think I spent in the summer I was just going through like golden age Hollywood melodramas, um, but I was doing that as like research. So like, what what is it that drew you to these film noirs and uh, and has stuck with you about them? Well, I I guess. I- uh, you know, film noir comes out of um, the pulp writing of the 30s and 40s. And so I've always been a huge Dash Hammett and Raymond Chandler fan, like oh, nice. and Hemingway. So I, I love that really spare, nihilistic, male-driven, existential kind of writing and literature and ethos. And so film noir was that, right? And I, I, I like the fact that it's it's cynical it's um it's jazzy it it uh, it you know it always looks beautiful like but it's not just style over substance like i find so many movies now are just over stylized but they don't have anything they don't have any substance like film noir did have substance like of course it was the focus wasn't always on character um but i i i just love the the kind of ethos of it all and the kind of understated uh, like, you know, the wisecracking dialogue is great and stuff, but there's a certain minimalism to it. Like I'm a less is more type of uh, reader and director to begin with. And so I love that less is more style. Um, and, uh, and so it's, and there's just, I just love the, the, the kind of the, the mystery. You're just kind of enveloped in this, in this world. It's like, it's just like, you're kind of coded in this black and white world. And I find 
for me, if I want to escape and just relax and watch something, when it, when I, I could turn on most really good film noirs and just escape more easily than anything else, I think. So we're going to move on to the next film, and the next category here is motivation. So motivation represents a film that came to Robert at a time when he was just breaking into the industry, kind of uh, gave him a reason and a, and a path to, you know, break through. Uh, so the film that you gave me here was Don't Look Back, which is, uh, I think it's 1967, uh, D.A. Pennebaker. Is it Penny Baker or Penny Backer? That's a good question. Penny Baker. Penn and Baker. Uh, it's a documentary about Bob Dylan, and it follows him in 1965 as he delivers a show in London, England. Um, and this is one that I think kind of stands out as as unique and really interesting on your list, because the rest have been obviously fiction films, uh, and and you are a fiction filmmaker, um, but this is a documentary. And uh, so, what what made you choose this? What motivated you about Don't Look Back? Well, a couple things. Um, more than anything is just Bob Dylan in terms of, um, you know, I, I mentioned that I fell in love with Raging Bull at the age of 15. I kind of fell in love with Dylan at the age of 15 or 16. And um, in terms of all of the kind of artistic um, inspirations for me, whether it's film or music, like Dylan is by far head and shoulders above anybody else, including Scorsese or any filmmaker. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, even even in my late teens, I, I was such a Dylan fan. I, I I would go on the road and see lots of concerts. Like I've seen Dylan over a hundred times, and I I I I just became a huge huge Dylan fanatic at a quite a young age. And I think uh, th this is a film. So so on the one hand, it's the subject matter that Dylan has been kind of my guiding inspiration artistically, um, and so I wanted to kind of I think it represents me as an artist to kind of include a Dylan film. Yeah, um, you got it at this but, point. And... But but on the other side of things, um, <clears throat> I do think that cinema verite, Penna Baker's kind of aesthetic, which he kind of invented a bit in the 60s in terms of how to follow someone and how to do that kind of a doc, has become a really obviously critical kind of style that a lot of feature filmmakers have emulated. And again, even in a film <clears throat> like Born to be Blue, at least with the black and white stuff, which we did as handheld, the, 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 that kind of that feeling when I think of, of, of music and I think of music movies in the fifties or sixties, I think of that style, that fly on the wall kind of style. And again, that was something that came up when I, when I made uh, born to be blue and that, that style has even kind of informed a little bit of the way I made Delia's gone, this latest movie I, I did. Um, <clears throat> and uh, it's, you know, it's just, I think documentary can be really useful in, in order to capture a certain, naturalism for people to be kind of aware of like of of embracing situations which like a lot of times my favorite scenes in my films are scenes that we just improv or invent that are kind of ripped off the script mm -hmm. like my latest film Dilly is gone i just realized the other day like opens and closes on stuff that was never in the script that that i we just kind of came up with and there's a certain documentary embracing of of that that one has to like a lot of directors can get so focused that they just want to, you know, achieve their exact vision and they're, they're less collaborative, less right. open to stuff. I love to, I get more excited when I just find new things and, and my vision doesn't work and I create a new vision or something. And so to me, like uh, documentaries like that. Um, and I, again, I think it's, it's also just a beautiful doc and I love the music and I love Dylan. So there's yeah. so much. I, how could you not? So right? rich. Like <laughs> Exactly. Okay, but um, before we talk more about the movie, I just want to know what's do you have like favorite Dylan song, favorite Dylan album? Uh, <laughs> or is that too hard? <laughs> uh, um, it's pretty hard. Uh, I it mean, is. It's uh, difficult. I I I, lo I love. Uh, there's a tune, "Every Grain of Sand," um, which is probably one of my favorite Dylan tunes. And I, it's funny because I've seen him so many times. I often sometimes equate his um, tunes to live performances I've seen. So, for example, in 1995, just um, before I went to film school, I saw Dylan in, in a show at the Electric Factory in Philadelphia in December 1995, and he, he played this version. That was the last show of the tour, and he played Every Grain of Sand at that show. And so that live recording mm. of Every Grain of Sand is my favorite Dylan song, but it's also connected to an experience 
um, not just like the studio version of that song I never listened to, the live versions of that song, particularly that night that I was there, right. is, is so meaningful for me because I listen to that song now and I remember myself as a 23-year-old in, in university and what it meant to me and how I drove to Philadelphia that night and drove home and, and there's just magic that night. And so um, I'm, I'm quite into like live music and, and how songs can be reinvented. And it's one of the things I loved about Dylan and I think is inspiring for any artist, whether it's film or music, is just being able to build a career and reinvent yourself and do different genres and kind of hold to your hold to your vision. It's it's way harder than people think it is, um, and so it's it's quite inspiring in that in that way. And it's also you know, it's simultaneously for Dylan, like you know he's very conscious when he's on camera, like he's an actor, but he also pretends oh, he's yeah. not an actor, but it's all about identity for Dylan. So, you know, as much as like, it seems like cinema verite, Dylan went on to make some of his own movies like Ronaldo and Clara and eat the document and other movies where he's like pretending he's just kind of acting natural, but he's not acting natural. Like he, and that's what I love about Dylan. You never know when the mask is on or off. And that's, yeah. Those issues of identity are so interesting. Yeah, it brings to mind, I mean, this uh, this cinema verite kind of style that uh, Penn and Baker uses here, um, I mean, it's it's everywhere now, right? It's it's reality TV. It's, um, you know, they there's like five or six concert documentaries every year that follow an artist around in the exact same way that Don't Look Back does. Like there was just a Billie Eilish movie that came out that, you know, uh, or like there's... I think Netflix releases like five or six a year and they're all, you know, they all have roots going all the way back to, uh, to this, right. They all have roots going back to Bob Dylan, um, you know, just in front of a camera, just being himself and, you know, how much of that is himself and how much of that is just showmanship. I don't know. Right. It also kind of, um, I, I could link this together with, um, with Raging Bull and with uh, with one of our later picks as well, in that uh, something I really like about Don't Look Back is that it it shows Dylan not as like perfect. It's not like, hey, look, this guy's the greatest artist of his generation. He has no flaws. Like it shows him kind of grimy and like yelling at his uh, his assistants, and you know, like it shows the uh, the flawed side of him as well. Like I think. You, one thing I noticed in the movie is you never see him like without a cigarette and he's always like smoking it down to the filter. Um, and there's just all these things that are like, I don't know, anti-heroic about this character. You know, he, he kind of represents that cinematic thing that I, uh, that I saw in Raging Bull as well. He, he has that sort of uh, anti-hero figure about him in this movie. Yeah, no, totally. I mean, Dylan is one of the classic kind of anti-hero outlaws, if there ever was one in music. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's, that's what he writes about. And that's the life he's lived. Like the moment he kind of arrived in New York, making up all these crazy lies about his past, he kind of reinvented himself as, as some kind of outlaw from day one. And he's, He's still doing that to this day. Like, oh yeah, like you know, he and, uh, was it the Pulitzer Prize or the Nobel Prize that he won? And he basically told the committee to just go fuck themselves. <laughs> yeah, the Nobel. He didn't. He didn't yeah, bother the getting the award. He eventually, he eventually got it. But he, yeah, he, he's just so fascinating. The fact that he's still making amazing records, like his latest rec record, Rough and Ready Ways, is I, I love it. And the fact that he's been doing this for five or six decades at such a super high level. Nobody has come close to that kind of output. Um, you know, uh, people. You know, people often compare him to like the Beatles or the, you know the Stones went on longer, but they the Stones haven't really written new any worthy no. new songs the last thirty years. Like most of their songs are just kind of like throwbacks to like they're not writing about themselves as old guys facing mortality. Dylan is like equaled what the Beatles did in that decade, but then he's in each subsequent decade, he's done great stuff. Like the eighties is the only decade that wasn't like quite as strong for Dylan. Like the seventies was amazing. Nineties, two thousand, like he, he had a couple new records each of those years. Yeah. The eighties, I still say he had some great records, but he was like, like, you know, he's become less like culturally relevant in some ways, but um, it, it does all, you know, it does all trace back to don't look back in terms of at least him being on, on film. And, don't look back also has kind of 
arguably one of the first music videos ever made when he, he does subterranean homesick blues with the cards and Allen Ginsberg and stuff. Mm -hmm. They hadn't really done music videos then. And so he, you know, they kind of inadvertently created the first music video uh, in Don't Look Back. And that's, uh, that's in some ways almost one of the earliest rap songs too, uh, Subterranean Homesick Blues. People probably don't think of Dylan as a rapper, but Subterranean Homesick Blues is, is kind of like a rap song. Yeah. Um, so it, yeah, so much goes back to that. It really does. And uh, he, he's just always been a storyteller. I think that's something mm -hmm. that you mentioned his new album, but he has, um, I think it's 25 minutes long. There's a 25 minute song on that record about the assassination of JFK. Um, mm. and somehow it's not corny at all. And he makes it work. Like, I think the thing that shocked me is, uh, you know, when I heard that Bob Dylan last year had released, uh, a near 30 minute long song about John F. Kennedy, I, I just thought, okay, that's, that's strange. But if the song just captivated me the entire way through. And he's just, he's a, such a storyteller. Um, and even, you know, when he's on screen in a documentary about him, he's still the one in control of the story. He's the one telling the story. It's all him. Oh, totally. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's a really great film. And it's another one I hadn't seen. So thank you for putting it on your list because I, I could finally get around to it as also a Bob Dylan fan. Uh, so the next movie we're going to talk about fits into a category called Desperation. So this is a movie that came to Robert at a time when, uh, you know, things weren't as great in the industry. And, uh, you know, I feel like uh, everyone hits a point when they start to question, is this really worth it? Is this worth the struggle? Uh, so the film that you gave here for Desperation is uh, Paul Thomas Anderson's 2007 film, There Will Be Blood, uh, which great film. I mean, that's uh, just like Raging Bull. I'd say this is like a similar Goliath in the type of like, like how much renown this movie's gotten. So uh, before we start talking about it, I'll just describe a bit about it for anyone who uh, who's listening to this and hasn't seen the film, which if you haven't, go watch it. You know, this is, uh, it's a classic. It's, uh, I mean, it's just over 10 years old and it's already kind of cemented itself as, uh, as a classic in the canon. Uh, but the film is, uh, it's set at the turn of the 20th century um, and it follows Daniel Plainview, played by Daniel Day-Lewis. And Plainview is an oil prospector uh, who is kind of a, a shark. He goes from place to place um, lying uh, and taking land for cheap, building on it, uh, and basically uh, comes up with sort of a... Uh, I'm trying to think of the word here. He becomes like an uh, an oil mogul uh, gradually through the years through uh, very shady means. Uh, and it's about his conflict with religion and family. Um, it's a, a great film. So, Robert, when when did There Will Be Blood kind of come into your life? Well, I um, the first feature I had made um, was this small northern film called uh, That Beautiful Somewhere which I shot in 2005 and which was released in 2006. And I had made a series of short films leading up to that when I shot that. And, um, you know, at that time I, I, I wasn't really up to that up to speed with like the film world and, 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 um, putting things together. But I, I remember, you know, being excited to have shot my first feature because it's always a big deal to shoot your first feature after you've done short films, but then coming out of that, just being like, Oh, like what the fuck? Like I, I, I wasn't really sure like what the next steps were. Now that that film just kind of came together in a strange way because someone had seen my sh a short film I did. And we kind of did it on our own. We didn't really do it as much through the industry at the time. And so uh, I was, I, you know, I always find that the after finishing a film, you're kind of on a high, and then there's kind of a low. Cause it's like, uh, what's next? And that was the first kind of feeling I've had of that. But in that case. I was much less experienced and I wasn't that connected in the business. And so, you know, so that, that, that's where the um, desperation kind of element comes in. So then go ahead a year to 2007 and I started kind of flapping around, looking at my next projects, but not really knowing what I was doing. And it, it's one of those times where you, you know, you're kind of like, okay, uh, am I going to follow this up? Am I going to do another feature again? Am I just like a one-off kind of guy? And, 
And I, you know, for, for many years after that, I, I took swings at bigger projects. I was circling a few bigger things that I came very close. Instead of just doing like in retrospect, I should have just followed that up with an, another couple small movies and just kept making them. But I was, I kind of got enticed by a couple bigger movies that I thought could happen. And I'd spent two or three years on each one and suddenly five, six years pass and I'm like, I haven't done another feature. And, and then Born to be Blue, which, which I'm sure we'll even talk about a bit more later. I finally shot that in 2014 or 15, but that was like three or four years in the making, just getting all the shenanigans together and bringing it together. So I, I had this really long gap between uh, that beautiful summer and Born to be Blue. And that, that's the gap where it's like, if it had continued to go on at some point, I just would have been like, who, I don't think I would have ever given up. But at some point you're just like, am I ever gonna make another movie again? There Will Be Blood came at the start of that phase because it was only 2007. But I was right. just starting to feel that desperation of like, oh shit, what am I going to do now? Am I ever going to make another movie? And seeing that film, and I remember seeing it, that film I did see, uh, that film I did see in Toronto, I remember at the Varsity Cinema in, 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 the, in the big cinema there. Um, and just being like, oh my goodness, like it was so inspiring. And it just kind of, blew my mind i was i was already a paul thomas anderson fan but that that film just blew my mind and so um on one hand i was just you know you're kind of inspired you're like oh great i i, I love movies again i am gonna make another movie on the other hand you're just like this is so good i'm never gonna do anything remotely like this i should just quit <laughs> now and just open a b and b and just forget about filmmaking yeah um, so it's simultaneously depressing and and motivating and that's kind of that that that's where I was at in my life and why it it kind of struck me and why I listed it as my desperation film. That's funny because <clears throat> yeah, there there definitely is an element of that when you see a a really great film. It's it's a, a goes hand in hand like oh wow, I love film so much. This is just like the best thing ever. And ooh, I'm never gonna <laughs> I'm never gonna be able to do that. Um, yeah. But <laughs> that's interesting. So. The film kind of like helped, did it help you get out of that funk of like, you know, am I going to make another movie or did it just kind of dig you deeper into that? Well, ultimately I didn't make another movie until 2015. So the, the short answer is it took another seven or eight years before I made my feature. So it didn't obviously pull me out of anything, but it did inspire me because so much of um, the early part of one's film career is surviving and basically having the willpower and the self-belief to stay alive and stay afloat and pay the rent long enough to get your break and born to be blue for me, it was my kind of career break that mm -hmm. then opened things up a bit, but so many times that I've seen so many colleagues, they don't, they don't quite get to that spot and then they're, and then they're kind of gone. Um, but I think films like that and, and, you know, ironically the same year, no country for old men was made and literally both, both were shot in, I think, Texas in that yeah. same time. Well, one of my favorite stories is that No Country for Old Men had to shut down shooting for a day because uh, the oil fire scene was happening um, just like, you know, a few miles away. And the sky was just full of, you know, a, a dark, smoky cloud. So uh, the Coens had to shut down their shoot for the day. <laughs> that's funny because that's like, and I, I'm a pretty huge Coen Brothers fan, and I, I I always loved that film and the aesthetic of that film, and that was made in the same year. That was a really good year to 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 have No Country for Old Men going up against There Will Be Blood. Yeah. To think that There Will Be Blood didn't win the best Oscar is crazy, but then you realize, oh, that was the No Country year. That was yeah. a very strong year. And so, although that I think films like that uh, do provide one kind of inspiration fuel to just kind of like keep you going and, and help you kind of not give up and stuff in those moments. So I, I find it's useful in that sense, even though they're kind of inspiring there. It, you know, it just, it reminds you of why you're doing this um, and what's, what's achievable and stuff. So it's useful in that sense. Yeah. I, I think something that, I mean, obviously I'm, I'm 22. I'm, I'm nowhere near where you are, but I know whenever I see, a great movie. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind after, um, wow, I'm never going to be able to do this is I always think, well, someone's got to, right? Like, no, you know, like you, why not? Right. Um, and I think, I feel like there's an element of that whenever you see like a really great movie, it's not just like a, 
oh, wow, uh, how can I ever match that? It's, you know, well, someone's going to match that someday, right? Why not yeah, me? Yeah, maybe, maybe that could be me, yeah. Right? Um, and I don't know. I, I think that that's such an interesting thing about this film. Uh, it really is just a, a, a powerful reminder that, like, like you said, with, with it losing the Oscar, that no matter how good of a movie you make, you know, it's uh, there's always going to be someone else making the best that they've ever done as well, right? Um, you know, even if you make your best work, like, you know, you have to kind of work on a scale of of, of yourself instead of, like, um, you know, what everyone else is doing. Because, like, does it matter that There Will Be Blood didn't win Best Picture? I don't think so, right? But, like... Oh, no. Yeah, it doesn't matter at all. Um, because, you know, that stands as, like... They're both classic films, that and No Country for Old Men. Um, and they're both some of the best work that both of those filmmakers have done. Uh, well, all three of those filmmakers, because Coen Brothers did that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, linking this back to Born to be Blue and Raging Bull and Don't Look Back, um, Daniel Plainview is another one of those antiheroes. That's the link I see through all of these films that you uh, you gave. Is mm. You know, there's that sort of um, tragic character i wouldn't say dylan's a tragic character uh, but i mean definitely phantom lady has that element uh and raging bull has that element of you know uh an anti-hero uh who ends up in the end very unhappy uh and there will be blood is kind of the same thing right it's it's that tragic anti-hero um so i don't know i i see that really linking to born to be blue and stockholm as well so in when you were doing those films, were you thinking about There Will Be Blood as well? Or is it just like coincidence that it's another one of those tragic figures? No, I mean, I don't think I was specifically thinking about There Will Be Blood, but I think you bring up a good point is that you don't realize that when you're um, making movies and the more you start to do, but you look back and you, you, you do realize, and it's like the same with any director or artist, that you do have certain um, tastes and pre preoccupations with things and you find yourself making versions of the same movie or being attracted to the same thing. And like flawed male protagonist antiheroes are something I've always been drawn to. And they keep coming up like in Born to be Blue, like you said, in Stockholm. My current movie, Delia's Gone, Stefan James plays uh, a, a flawed, tragic antihero character. Uh, and so, yeah, it seems to come up on every film, I guess. And that, that seems like that was uh, that was your link to film noir as well. That's why you uh, really loved those films. So yeah, I'm seeing a I'm seeing a connection, a common theme. Yeah, yeah. That's that's so mm, cool. I, I, I got to do something different, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> the, 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 but the more I try, I, I just end up back at the same spot with a flawed male antihero. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I feel like that's just the the plight of an artist. Everyone just ends up yeah. making different versions of you know the same story, right? Because it's yeah. it's what you connect with, and it's what uh, you keep coming back to. But that doesn't mean that the mm. films aren't unique, right? I mean, yeah. Paul Thomas Anderson is uh, in There Will Be Blood. He's definitely. Uh, guilty of the same. I mean, he he definitely makes different versions of the same kind of story over and For over, sure. right? I mean, um, I think my favorite of his is uh, is Phantom Thread. That's uh, mm. definitely the one that has stood stood out to me the most. But you can definitely see a connection between Phantom Thread and uh, Inherent Vice and The Master, um, and there will be blood. Even back to like Boogie Nights, you know, there's always that um, that flawed uh, male protagonist that kind of drives the story forward. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I I, th I think that uh, you and Paul Thomas Anderson might have something in common there, because uh, mm -hmm. the themes that you both kind of uh, handle do seem to to be quite similar in a lot of ways. Yeah, I mean, he's he he's certainly been always been one of the filmmakers I've really admired especially his um his later work like in particular like there will be blood in the master i love the master the master to me just keeps holding up um so well uh he's uh, yeah I'm, I'm i don't know he's got a new film that he's that's in the can that's probably going to come out next year which uh, it's always an event to see a paul thomas anderson film Oh yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned seeing there will be blood at the varsity and like, I just hope theaters are open by the time, uh, you know, his new one comes out because I'd love to catch that at the varsity in 70 millimeter and just, you know, 
kind of revel in that. I, I was lucky enough to, I got to see, um, Phantom Thread in 70, uh, at Tiff Bell Lightbox and, uh, what an experience, you know, like he just, he curates everything down to, he, uh, he came up with a playlist so that when you saw Phantom Thread in 70 millimeter, when you were waiting in the theater, his music was playing and it was his playlist, uh, that would, you know, while you're sitting there waiting, there's no pre-show, there's no trailers. It's just Paul Thomas Anderson's pre-selected pu- uh, music there. And, um, <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a, a whole other level of like, um, controlling everything all the way to, you know, what people are hearing before your movie starts. It's just great. awesome though. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, I remember seeing the 70 mil print of the master at Tiff Bell Lightbox too. And, uh, I mean, I mean, I miss those. There's not too many of those 70 millimeter screenings anymore, um, but they are beautiful to see. Yeah. Yeah. There's definitely, that's actually, before we move on to our final movie, I want to know, do you shoot digital or film? Oh, I shoot digital, like, because in Canada, it's pretty impossible because we don't really have a film lab here anymore. And so to to shoot it on- Not really uh, many good ones, at least. Yeah, I mean, there is, I know there there was one, the one out of Montreal, but to really shoot on 35, you kind of have to send it to New York or something. And then then there's delays and you have bonding issues. And like, I've I've gone down the road before and I I probably technically could have shot a film like Born to be Blue on 35 back in the day, but- um, I do feel like with with the lenses and with Alexa and with film grade that you can put on films and stuff, you know, you're not sacrificing that much. I still would love to shoot on film, but it it's not as important. Like especially if it's a contemporary film, like if it's a period movie, I just I think the quality of the grain and the image there is something intrinsically useful about that because it's it helps sell the suspension of disbelief and the fantasy of going back in time. Like people equate old things with film. Whereas something clean, something like a really clean image now um, is just more what people are used to for contemporary, like contemporary society. And so I, I think it's fine. Like, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, and it makes, uh, I, I mean, as much as film does give a really cool quality to it, it can be replicated now. I mean, even with, and this is the last thing I'll say on this, um, here just because, you know, I, I want to move on to to what the meat of this podcast is. But I know uh, David Fincher shoots everything on digital, and he just did Mank about Citizen Kane, uh, all set in the past, and he made it look like it was on film, but it was shot digitally, you know? Mm. So uh, I, I think that, you know, there's flexibility with both. Um, even though those 70 millimeter prints are just beautiful to see in theaters, and, you know, it is such an experience to go to, like, the Varsity or to TIFF to, to catch a 70 millimeter film. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's not as necessary anymore, I guess. No, um, it's not. so the final category that I gave Robert, uh, is appreciation. So now this is a film that, uh, that has come out pretty recently. And this is a film that, uh, is made by sort of a contemporary in the industry. Uh, and the whole point of this category is finding something that Robert is really just appreciating, uh, at the moment, something that, you know, at, uh, I mean, I mean, for all intents and purposes, uh, Robert, you've made it. You've broken in. You're there. Uh, you know, you, uh, you're making movies in Hollywood. That's fantastic. Well, I mean, outside the Hollywood system, I guess, because you're you're working in Canada, but you're working with Hollywood actors, uh, and the films are on that level and have that budget. Um, so this is a film that you're seeing right now that uh, that you're really appreciating. Uh, from someone who's a contemporary. And the film that you chose is The Last Black Man in San Francisco. Uh, 2019 film, very independent, uh, sort of became like a a breakout success. Um, So for any of our viewers that haven't seen it, uh, Robert, could you actually like explain what is The Last Black Man in San Francisco? Good question. I mean, to me, it's like, it's really a love letter to a city. And in in this particular case, the city is San Francisco. And it's, it's about these um, two young kind of black artist friends who um, like one of them basically is trying to track his own heritage uh, linked, linked to a house that was in his family. And it's kind of this journey to understand themselves, to understand the city, to understand his heritage through, through the, through this house. And, um, and 
it just struck me because I'd, I'd read the good reviews and stuff, but I wasn't really prepared for just like the sheer beauty of it all in terms of the way that the filmmaker, and I think it was a first time filmmaker, um, yeah, working it was with his debut, like working with an act, working with a real life character, uh, in one of the roles and then a pretty young Jonathan majors, um, in another, in the other key role, um, created something which on one hand was so naturalistic and real. And then other stuff was like very stylized with like operatic music and slow motion and stylized color. A bit like Raging Bull when you look at it, like combining the naturalistic with, with a very st stylized thing and just creating this world and this vibe. Um, and I believe, I believe the filmmaker, you know, is a white filmmaker and he's effectively doing a, like a black story. Mm -hmm. And, um, which I think is really fascinating because, you know, we're living in these very politically correct times. And I think, um, black stories and diverse stories are always important to tell. And I think finally people are starting to realize the importance of those stories. And to me, um, you know, this film isn't overtly trying to capitalize on that zeitgeist, but it indirectly does slip into that zeitgeist. Yeah. Um, and, and. And there's like more stories like that that we need to see. I mean, it's a classic case of like something like a, a plan B or an A24 or something, finding a, a gem and helping elevate it and bring it to the world. And then when, when they do that and we see it, we realize how great of a piece of art and work it is. And there's probably more of those gems out there that often sometimes don't get that support, mm -hmm. but um, it just, yeah, it, it really blew me away. And when I, um, I lived in San Francisco for a year um, when I was out West. I did a few years in Vancouver and then a year in San Francisco. And I kind of fell in love with San Francisco. And being in San Francisco is also partly connects back to my love of film noir because Dashiell Hammett um, yeah. wrote about San Francisco. And I lived on the edge of the Tenderloin, right where Dashiell Hammett wrote all the stories. So I went on this huge Dashiell Hammett kick when I lived in San Francisco and film noir thing. And so, it's connected to the film noir and it's connected to, and I just have this San Francisco, is such a romantic, amazing city. And then to see such a great love letter to a city like that, that I still hold kind of dear to my heart. Cause I spent a year of my like early twenties there, which was a magical year. It just, it, it kind of hit me on a real personal level and it was yeah. really inspiring. It's also the city of vertigo, which you said, uh, is one of your favorites, right? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I think you uh, you said something important there, which is, um, you know, Joe Talbot, who directed the film, is a white director telling a black story. And the thing that I find interesting is no one uh, no one pointed that out as an issue with the film. Uh, and I don't think it is because you can tell how careful and how respectful uh, he's being with the story, and especially I mean, the screenplay was written in collaboration between Joe Talbot and the lead actor, Jimmy Fails. Um, and Jimmy Fails was, um, he was the, uh, actor in the film, uh, and he's playing mm -hmm. himself. So he wrote the story about himself, mm -hmm. um, with Joe Talbot and then, uh, Joe Talbot directed it. But yeah, it is interesting that, you know, this is a story, um, that is very much about, uh, the black experience in America. Um, but it's it's one that no one's had a problem with the fact that the director is a white guy. It's pretty cool um, because you know yeah, he, he told the story respectfully. I, yeah, I, and I I do think it's harder and harder to get away with that, even though there shouldn't be a limitation on that. But I I do think uh, for good reason, you know, people are sensitive to whatever you want to call it, whether it's cultural appropriation, or whatever. But in my mind, it's just like, there's so many great stories that involve diverse elements that I want to be able to tell. And, you know, I'm always fascinated by stories, whether they include race, race elements or whether they just include diverse actors, like even, you know, Raging Bull, or sorry, not Raging Bull, um, Born to be Blue, sorry. Um, you know, it was one of the fascinating things that drew me to the story was this, was this beautiful white man, Chet Baker, who basically idolized these black artists and wanted to fit into the black world and was shunned from the black world because of his kind of white beauty in a way. So, and, you know, and he, and he had a mixed race wife, um, and, but race was never a thing for him, but race is a component in that film. Mm -hmm. um, 
and, and in that that's got to be in any Chet movie Baker's about story. jazz, right? Of course, and and so, and it was you know in, in this latest film I did, Delia's Gone. I you know I cast Stephon James, a great black actor, not because not because he's black, but just because I think he's a fantastic actor. And it just so happens that, you know, rural crime dramas tend to be very white because they're all set in small town America. So they're just, the protagonists are always white, which is just starts to get a bit cliche and boring, to be yeah. honest. You're seeing the same and so, story told over and over, right? Yeah. And I think to be able to cast Stefan James brought a freshness. And again, I didn't, I didn't cast him because he was black. I cast him because he's a great actor, but it's, it automatically brings you something fresh and interesting yeah. into the genre. And, you know, when I did that, you know, there was certainly a number of people who said, oh, you've got a, you know, you've, you've got a great black actor now in your film. Are you going to like make it about race? And I was like, absolutely not. It was never a race story. Just because I cast a great black actor doesn't mean I have to rewrite the story to turn it into a race story. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's something that inevitably comes up because there is just such a built in history of prejudice and thoughts about uh, actors of color and, and whether that the stories would that they're in have to be about that. And again, going back to the last, last black man in San Francisco, it is about race on one hand, but on another hand, it's not about race. It's yeah. about these two guys. And, and it's about race and the fact that it explores um, social hierarchy. Yeah. In, and in gentrification. City, like all in America. And, and gentrification. So inevitably it, it's super tied up in race in America as a microcosm, yeah. but there's, there's ways to tackle that without being as, direct and i think that did it in a really poetic interesting kind of way yeah and it showed that they were outsiders you know in a city and and they were kind of i think a lot of people sometimes feel like outsiders in their city whether they're black or or white or brown or whatever they are for various reasons and um for various hardships and they just but they still love their city so on one hand they hate the city on the other hand they love their city and that's yeah. what those guys felt like about san francisco yeah there's a and, great line uh, in it which is um do you, uh, I think Jimmy is sitting on the bus, uh, and there's this girl who is talking about how much she hates San Francisco. Uh, and he says, excuse me, miss, do you love this city? Uh, and she says like, I guess so. And he says, well, you don't get to hate the city unless you love it. Yeah. Yeah. Which yeah, is a great, line. great line. Absolutely yeah, great yeah. line. But yeah. I think that the, the, the film is really it's about friendship more than anything. It's about these two mm. guys who are, like you said, they're outsiders in this city. Um, and especially this, uh, the, the main character who, you know, has this, this house that's belonged to his family forever and now doesn't belong to his family. He's kind of been pushed out of it. Uh, and he keeps going back day after day to, to keep up the exterior of the house and make sure that the new owners uh, don't ruin it. Uh, so he's mm. like outside painting the windowsills and, uh, and gardening for them, uh, even though, you know, they want him to just go away. Um, I, I don't know. I You mentioned something really interesting as well, that um, the film is, it balances the, the poetic with the real. And there's just so much surrealism in this movie. Like, it's a really weird movie in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, even from the way it starts with uh, with people in hazmat suits cleaning up a river. Um, and they look like they're on some alien planet. Um, but there's just so much expressionism and just weird imagery in this movie that, you know, it's not within the story. It's like totally outside of what, uh, what the story's talking about, but it's just imagery that gives you a real sense of place. I don't know. It's, it's so, I've never seen a film like this really. Well, and there's also that that's part of the documentary approach because in documentaries and my wife's a documentary filmmaker, so much about shooting documentaries is about having a story and then going out and shooting tons of B-roll and basically being able to cut all this B-roll with good music while you're telling a story. And I find like in films like that, where you're, you're cutting to all this stuff, it's kind of like very stylized, beautiful B-roll of San Francisco that's cut into the main story. But the thing is thematically, it can all be linked. And yeah. just like in a good documentary. And so I feel like that's, again, that's part of the docu influence is, is and you know, that, that, that was a movie that I think they shot over a, a large, a large period of time on their home turf. So they, they had the ability to basically, and even though the budget was low, because when you, when you shoot a film like that, you actually have much less constraints than when you shoot a bigger movie with on a unionized budget in 22 days, it's like, 
low budget films I admire often because it's like they actually have more resources. They they shoot it over like three or four months, and they they sh- like every night they sneak out a magic hour and shoot amazing things. And it's just because they have almost no crew, no cast, they're paying huge amounts to. They have their own gear, and yeah. they create these beautiful things that you, you you almost can't do that in a in a more um, in a bigger budget model. And yeah. you can see the kind of freedom and joy of that. And so I, it makes me envious. <laughs> <laughs> There's this kind of like beauty and uh, and perfectionism in the movie as well, right? Like every yeah. image is just like, the colors just pop. And I just, I don't know how they did it. I don't know how they made the film look the way it does. It just looks so gorgeous. And like you said, it's probably just a lot of time and a lot of freedom to like just spend the time getting the shot. So much of the exterior stuff is, yeah, shooting in the right direction at the right time of yeah. day. Yeah, yeah, and with uh, a and lot being, of diffusion. Yeah, being there ready, yeah, being there ready uh, and, and and getting it and shooting lots of stuff. Um, but, yeah, it's that's uh, that, that film really kind of blew me away. Like I said, when I saw it, it was, it was a pretty special movie. Do you think you'd ever, uh, you know, strip things back and, and go back to sort of um... – you know, try making a movie in that style uh, of, uh, you know, just going with a low budget, spending a lot of time and, you know, kind of trying to perfect every moment. Do you think you'd ever venture into that yeah. style of shooting? For sure. I mean, I'd love to, I'd love to, I have to talk about it whenever I finish a shoot and I get kind of bummed up by unions and bigger crews. I have to say, I'm just going to go shoot like a low budget film with like, with no money and this or that. And then it, I end up not doing it, but um, I would, I would like to, I would like to, yeah. The short answer is yeah. Maybe next and time, right? <laughs> it, yeah. It, to be honest, like this last film I did, Delia's Gone, even though the budget was higher and we did have a big cast, a lot of the ethos of it, because we shot during coronavirus and we, we, we did shoot it run and gone on a very tight schedule with very short days. And it yeah. was, the film really did feel like uh, a pretty low budget indie film that just has big actors in it and better production value and people are all getting paid better. But it had the ethos of a small little indie film, which I liked. Like I, I kind of get off on that. I quite liked it. Yeah, you mentioned that you really like those small crew shoots. So, I mean, maybe that's something to incorporate going forwards uh, as well, right? That's um, a really interesting kind of uh, observation. Is that like, yeah, even though all these restrictions came in and uh, and made things really difficult, it also helped you rediscover something you love, which is like that run and gun style of shooting. Yeah. And there's just, there's always, you know, you, you sometimes hear stories. I don't know how true they are about, you know, people like Coppola shooting the conversation and films like that in, in, in 73, 74 with like a crew of 15 people and creating these amazing works. It's like, it's totally possible. You, you see people like Steven Soderbergh who shoot sometimes that like they either shoot really big things or they shoot really tiny things, but it's like, it's doable to shoot with small teams. You just have to be really smart and plan ahead. And I, I do kind of want to take a crack at like a super minimalistic crew. Yeah. Um, and you can still do that with big actors. There's certain actors like the Ethan, like people like Ethan Hawke are game for those kinds of things. If they're, if they're on the team and part of the, you know, part of the process. And he's a guy like Ethan's done a lot of low budget stuff because he's passionate about it. And he's an artist himself and he's a great filmmaker, director, producer himself. And so, there's ways to do it. And I, I'd like to, I'd like to try it. Awesome. And with that, that brings us to the end of today's podcast. Uh, so those five films, uh, all kind of telling a life and a career, uh, in movies. So I really want to thank you for coming on the show today, Robert. Uh, it's absolutely been such a pleasure having you here and hearing about kind of your take on, on these films and on your own films. And I'm so excited to see Delia's Gone. So when do you think we can expect uh, that to be popping up? Uh, we'll see. I mean, we're going to be delivering it in August. And like I said, we're going to be applying to the the usual suspects, uh, Toronto and all the various Canadian fall film festivals and some European and American ones. And so it, it, one way or another, it'll be on the, um, it'll be on some kind of fall film festival circuit, hopefully. And hopefully those are kind of somewhat physical. Hopefully we can actually go to festivals this fall. I think it's still going to be quite virtual, but, but realistically it would be the earliest, it would be the end of this year or like the first half of next year when it'll probably be like officially released. 
Fantastic. Well, we don't know yet. I, I hope it pops up at TIFF because, uh, you know, I, I love TIFF and I always go. So if it is, I will be watching it there and uh, I can't wait to see whatever you're cooking up. Uh, now, Thanks, before uh, before we go, I do have one more question. It's, uh, it's a fresh spin on an old, uh, old, old question here. So the question is, if there's one person alive or dead, fictional or real, that you would want to be stuck in a bank robbery with, who would it be? Now, it could be either you are robbing the bank together or you are both hostages. Who would be your ideal bank robbery buddy? My ideal bank robbery buddy. You know, this is normally the who would you want to have dinner with question, and that's boring, right? This isn't about someone that you just want to talk with. You're not, you know, because someone you might want to sit down for dinner with might be someone you don't want to be trapped in a bank with. Well, if if I was gonna, if I was gonna be in a bank robbery, I think I'd want to be with like a, you know, a cool, dynamic, great athlete in his prime. (laughs) I'd say like, I'd say like Michael Jordan in like nine in the like the early to mid nineties. Yeah, Chicago Bulls. I'd want to. I'd want to go in. I'd want to go in there with Jordan because he's fascinating and he's an amazing athlete. And he's charismatic. He can talk his way as, out of anything. He, he he could physically get us out of anything. So yeah, I'd say Jordan. Yeah, Jordan, good bank robbery, buddy. That's good. No, that's uh, that's a, a good choice. I feel like I would have gone with someone who I would have just been like, you know, I feel it would stay really calm, you know. Mm. And I feel like Jordan, you know, that's a, a good choice because. He's competitive. He knows I, and, how to be. He's a zen. He's a zen dude. When he when he has to get in the zone, he, yeah, and, he's and in win, the zone. He, he'll get there. Yeah. yeah. Did you see uh, the Netflix series about him? Of course, I loved yeah. it. I yeah. loved every second of that. It brought yeah. me back. It was so good. One thing I I really loved about that is you see that every single time someone challenges him or stands in his way, he just obliterates them. So you know, yeah. if yeah. you're being yeah. held hostage with Michael Jordan, I wouldn't want to see what he'd do to a bank robber. He would. Well, that's the thing. He, he he's a winner. Like he he finds a way to win. And if you're in a bank robbery, you you want to get out. You want to win. Yeah, you want to win. And yeah. he he would win. He'd find a way. Yeah. So that's that's a great answer. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And one final thing: uh, is there any way we can keep up with you? Are you on social media? Or are you? Do you have a website? Is there any way we can uh, keep up with what you're doing? Good question. I'm not a social media guy. Sad to say, I, I used to be, but I kind of just dropped off of that. But um. You know, one can go to, I guess I have a website. Technically, my company is called Lumanity. So you can go to Lumanity.com or, or, you know, to be honest, it sounds, it sounds old school, but the best way to get in touch with me is to call me or send me an email. Um, I don't really, you know, I, I kind of go on and off social media, but right now I'm not really on it. So. Perfect. Well, we'll uh, we'll put a link to your website in the show notes and uh, okay. well, I'm sure we all can't wait to see what you're uh cooking up next thanks man awesome well thank you so much for talking today and uh hope to have you on the show again sometime in the future sounds good man all right and cut that's a wrap for take four of take five action thank you to our guest robert boudreau for joining us today if you want to see more of robert you can check our show notes for his socials and any other information on him Be sure to subscribe to Take 5 Action wherever you get your podcasts, or you can find us at our website, fcff.ca. Take 5 Action is produced in collaboration with the Forest City Film Festival. And major thank yous to our producer, Nandita Dutta, our media consultant, Keith Tomasek, our editors, Juliana Estrada and Jeffrey Bremner, and our partners at OIART, and you, our listeners. Thank you for tuning in and be sure to join us again next week for our final episode of the season as we speak with actress Sheila McCarthy about golden age cinema, comedies, and some very emotional horror movies. My name is Matthew Downs and I'm the host and creator of this show and I can't wait to see you at the movies. 